So, what is the um, genetic code? The genetic code, what is it? What, um, what molecule is it stored in? DNA, very good. What does that stand for? Is the, the last A is an acid, that's correct, so DN acid. And the D stands for deoxyribo, and the N stands for nucleic, so it's deoxyribonucleic acid, which is a lovely little molecule. It's, well, actually, it's a big molecule. It's a lovely macromolecule. It's composed of two struts of ribose chains with phosphate bonds, and they wrap around each other in a kind of spiral, the so-called double helix. And the, um, the two struts on the side are connected with rungs. Those rungs are nucleotides, and there are four of them. Does anybody know their names? The names of the four nucleotides, or the names of the four bases that cross the DNA molecule. Who saw the movie Gattaca? Okay, so the movie Gattaca, the, the name of the, or the society, is composed of the letters that represent the four base pairs. Guanine, adenine, cytosine, thiamine. So G, A, T, and C, and they made up this city named Gattaca, or the society named Gattaca, out of those four letters. The sequence of those four letters down the chain of the DNA molecule is the language in which the genetic code is expressed. What does the genetic code express? It expresses proteins. What are proteins made out of? Amino acids. How many amino acids are there that exist in our bodies? There's a lot of amino acids, but only a few of them are actually in our bodies or in life on Earth. It's about 23. And they all have different characteristics. An amino acid might be slightly acidic. It might be slightly basic, even though it's called an acid. It might be, uh, enjoy a little bit of water, it might be water soluble, it might be oil soluble, it might have a slight uh, negative charge on its surface, it might have a slight positive charge on its surface. And all of those different characteristics combine to give the protein that, these amino that, the, uh, that are made up of amino acids a function. So a protein is a long linear chain of amino acids different amino acids, it folds itself up into a nice little wad, and that little wad has a function. So the DNA molecule encodes for the linear chain of amino acids. There are 23 amino acids, so how many of these four letters does it take to represent one amino acid? If a, an amino acid were represented by just one letter, you could only have four of them. If we use two letters, we're programmers, we know how this works. If we use two letters, then you could have 16 amino acids. So apparently we need three letters. And that's exactly what happens on the DNA molecule. Every three base pairs, every three of those rungs represents one amino acid. These are called codons. Codons. So you can think of a DNA molecule as this long chain of, of nucleotides. Every three of them represents an amino acid. And there's a little machine, which is a protein, a little machine that hooks up to the DNA molecule and ratchets down its length three base pairs at a time, emitting amino acids. There's even a start codon and a stop codon, as if some 1960s programmer had put this together. It's almost as though Alan Turing had put that together. Because the doggone thing looks an awful lot like a Turing machine. Well, enough of that. Today we're going to talk about clean architecture. What the heck is architecture? Why do we have it? And what would make it clean? It is not uncommon for me to go into a company, ask that company, 
what your architecture is and to have the programmer say, well, we're using Java. This is a .NET conference, I know, but still. We're using Java and Eclipse and Spring and Tomcat and Hibernate and MySQL is the database and of course we're using MVC. Got to use MVC. The guy who invented MC MVC is here at the conference. Did anybody attend uh, TrigV's talk? Oh yeah, okay. So the, the guy who invented Model View Controller is, was walking around here yesterday. I don't know if he still is. I, I um, was in the speaker's lounge yesterday morning and I saw him walk in. He doesn't know me from Adam. And uh, he was just sitting there and uh, my laptop did not have any power. So I started fumbling around looking for a cord and he got up and he pointed at a, at a socket and he said, you could plug it in here. And I got my cord and I plugged it in there. I shook his hand. I don't think I'll wash that hand for a while. <laughs> Model view controller in my hand. So, yeah, you know, even, you know, even I've got, you know, people that I, <laughs> I'm a fanboy over. So, that was not an architecture. What that was, was a list of tools. It did not tell me what their application did. It did not tell me uh, anything about their application other than that they read some white paper somewhere uh, and that said that they should be using Java, Spring, Hibernate, MySQL, whatever. What they told me was the tools that they had used to build their system. They did not tell me what the architecture of their system was. It would be as though I asked you for the architecture diagrams of your house and you came back to me with a list of tools, hammers, saws, screwdrivers, and said, this is the architecture of my house. No, it's not. I don't care to know the tools. What I want to know is the architecture of the house. Take a look at this architecture diagram. Are you getting these on the screen, by the way? Yes, good. Take a look at that architecture diagram. What kind of building do you think that is? Now you can see off to the left, there seem to be these long shelf-like things. And if you were to look at the, the printing there, you'd notice some keywords like uh, periodicals, magazines, things of that nature. And then if you look over to the right, you'll see there's this large area, uh, kind of like a reception area, and there's a desk there called circulation. And with a little bit of thought, you could say, you know, this looks sort of like a library. And if you, if you think of the word library and you put it against this diagram, you say, yeah, this looks like a library. There's, there's bookshelves. There's a few offices for people. It's a small library. There's a circulation counter. Could be a library. Or um, how about that one? Look at that one. That's a church. It's very, un very obviously a church. It's got a big central area with pews in it, and there's an altar over there. There's a reception area for people to gather in. There's lots of little Sunday school classrooms in there. This is clearly a church. The architectural diagram of these two buildings screams about the intent of the building. A list of tools like Spring, Hibernate, Tomcat, MVC, MySQL, ADO, whatever, whatever, does not tell us what the intent of the system is. It's not an architecture. An architecture tells us what this system does. A good architecture screams intended usage. You should be able to open up the first layer of the directory of your system and everybody should look at it and go, oh, that's a trading system. Oh, that's an accounting system. Oh, that's a banking system. You should be able to look at the top level and see what that system is. And you should be able to look at the individual files in there and say, oh, this is where we handle deposits. This is where we handle withdrawals. This is where we add transactions. This is where we, we audit the transactions. Everything that is done by that system 
should be hollered out at the top level of the application of the architecture diagram. The top level directory should just shout what that system does. Most top level directories, however, look like this. Here's the top level directory of a Rails application that I wrote several years ago. And uh, you can see that it's got a bunch of directories there. Um, controllers, helpers, models, util, views. Tells me nothing except that it's a Rails application. I recognize it instantly. That's what all Rails applications look like. They all have those top-level directories. As though that were important somehow. Why is it important that the very first thing I see when I open up that directory is Rails? Is Rails the critical decision, the foundational architecture decision of this system? Apparently. And yet, what does the system do? No clue. No clue at all. No, in, no, no hint of what this system does. It is, looks just like every other rail system out there. And if I, were to, if I were to need to know what this system does, I would have to dig it. I'd have to start opening up files and reading code. I'd have to look at the individual controllers. And what would those controllers tell me? They'd tell me URLs. They wouldn't tell me what they did. They'd tell me URLs. I would see the, the paths that got to them as though the paths, the URL paths, were somehow architecturally significant. And in order to work out what the application does, I would have to take all of those URL paths and map them out and go to the view files that they invoke and see what other controllers those view files invoke so that I could map out what this system does. And what I would end up with then is the navigation structure of the web pages, still not quite getting to what the system does. Once I had done that, then at least I could probably investigate into those navigation flows and figure out, well, here it seems to be adding numbers, and here it seems to be deducting things from totals in a database, and maybe I could work out the intent of the system. But we have taken, in a case like this, we have taken the intent of the system and smeared it out through a whole bunch of files, models, views, and controllers so that it is buried and smeared and spread throughout the code of the system. Nothing in that system tells me what that system does. What this structure tells me is the framework I used and that it's a web system. Two details that I would like to hide. What should I see at the top level? I should see what the system does. If I want to know how the system is delivered, oh, I want to know, is this a web system, or is it a, a thick client system, or is it a console-based system? I should have to hunt for that. That's a detail. That's something I'd like to go hunting for. I don't want that right up front. Does this system use Rails? I should hunt for that. That should be a detail off to the side somewhere that I have to go dig and suddenly and finally say, oh, oh, look, there's a binding off to the side here that makes this rails. Some of you will recognize this diagram. It shows your uh, controllers and your views and the business objects that they manipulate. And the business objects are invoked by the controllers. The controllers often receive URLs or HTTP requests from the web server, and then they control the dance of all the business objects that they manipulate. And then they invoke a view of some kind, and the view goes back to the business objects and pulls all the data out of the business objects so that it can display the result. Look at the tangle of dependencies there. The things that are clear and isolated are the controllers and the views. They are architecturally protected. The things that are muddled and confused and impacted by lots of other influences are the business objects. 
The business objects must serve the controllers and the views. They don't stand alone by themselves. They are not architecturally protected. They are polluted by the concerns of the views and the controllers. If you were to open up one of those business objects, you would see methods in there that were obviously methods for views and obviously methods that were supposedly coming from controllers. You would probably see, see uh, methods in the, in the business objects that had to do with forms that came from the web. You would very likely see methods in those business objects that had to do with displays that went out on the views. The business objects are not business objects at all. They are polluted by the web. I could look at those business objects and say, oh, this is a web system. I might not be able to look at those business objects and say, this is an accounting system. Now, obviously, I could see an account business object, but it's got all these methods in it to serve all these other concerns. That's a failure. That is a fundamental architectural failure because when we build systems like this, we have missed the point. Our system does not have an architecture anymore. What it has is a tool set. And our system is enslaved to that tool set. We have taken the tools and we have put them out front and we have enslaved the purpose of the system to the tools. Now, this is the exact opposite of what we should do. What we should do is put the purpose of the system out front and enslave the tools to the purpose of the system. Of course, tools are tools. They're meant to be used for a purpose. They are not meant to dominate. Who likes it? Who enjoys it when your business rules are enslaved to the tools. The people who make the tools, they enjoy that. It's a kind of self-validation. Look, we've made these tools, and now people like these tools so much, they've enslaved their applications to our tools. Oh, by the way, they'll keep on buying our tools forever. because There's no way they can ever separate from them anymore. This is not a conscious decision that people make. It is an unconscious decision. But imagine how comfortable it would be if you were the maker of a framework and you saw that everybody out there using your framework was inheriting from your base classes. How comfortable would that make you, especially if they were buying the framework? You'd know that they were tying themselves to you. They were putting on a little wedding ring with your name on it. You were not putting a wedding ring on with their name on it. They were marrying you, but you could stay independent from them. Essentially, they have a harem. You are one of the members of their harem, and they gather your money whenever they'd like. Now, obviously, this is different from how software architects have been telling us to work for years and years. One of the rules that, that software architects have said for decades is separate your user interface from the use cases. Not just the user interface, by the way. We'd like to separate a lot more than just the user interface. But for the moment, let's just talk about user interfaces. They should be separated from use cases. What are use cases? Use cases are just the, the uh, things that we do to the system, the features of the system, the, the business-derived behaviors of the system. We'll talk about them in a moment. We should separate the UI from them. The UI should become a detail. When we're building our system, we want to focus on the business rules and not focus on the web or whatever other delivery mechanism we are using. We would like to get the business rules working without worrying about how it's going to look on the screen or how the information is going to come in from the web or go out to the web. We just want a nice use case working. In fact, the purpose of a good architecture is to defer decisions, delay decisions. The job of an architect is not to make decisions. 
The job of an architect is to build a structure that allows decisions to be delayed as long as possible. Why? Because when you delay a decision, you have more information when it comes time to make it. If you make a decision early, you have the minimum amount of information to make it. If you can delay that decision, then you have the maximum amount of information required to make it. So a good architect builds a structure that does not commit to major decisions. What major decisions? Oh, what database we're going to use. That's a detail. We'll figure that out later. What database schema we're going to use. Detail. Don't care. What database technology we're going to use? Is it going to be a SQL database? Is it going to be a NoSQL database? Should we use Mongo? Should we use MySQL? Detail. Detail. Doesn't matter. Is this going to be a web system? Detail. Delay that. Don't need to know that just yet. Well, should we use nHibernate? Detail. Don't need to know that yet. I don't need to know any of that junk yet. I do not need to start my project with all the tools working. How many of you have ever had a, an iteration zero? where the purpose of that iteration zero was to get all the framework crap working. Get the database working, get the nHibernate stuff working, get the web server working, get all this crap working, paying absolutely no attention to the use cases. That is not the appropriate thing to do in an iteration zero. In an iteration zero, the kind of tools you want to get working are the source code control system, you probably ought to figure out what language you're going to use. That is an important decision. And you ought to be thinking about how you are going to defer all those other decisions. How are you going to construct a system that allows you to delay, as long as possible, all those other decisions? A good architect maximizes the number of decisions not made. Many years ago now, a little over a decade, uh, I started working on a project called Fitness. Who's used Fitness? Yeah, we've got a bunch of people in the room using Fitness. Good. I started on that project in 2001. Uh, and it, Fitness is a wiki. It's also an, an acceptance testing tool. It is a way of expressing tests that can be read and written by business people as opposed to programmers. And uh, it's done in the form of a wiki, so you can open up pages and add your tests in wiki style, save those pages, link to other pages, and so on. When we started writing it in 2001, we said, what database are we going to use? And we thought, well, there's really only one that we can use for an open source project. That would be MySQL. So let's get MySQL working. And somebody said, well, we really don't have to do that yet um, because there's this other functionality that we could get working first, which is the translation of the wiki text to HTML. It turns out that's a fairly large job in a wiki. It's kind of the, the primary function of a wiki taking markup language of wiki style and turning it into HTML. So we actually spent about three months just doing that, doing the nice little translations. And we invented an abstraction called Wikipage. And the Wikipage had a method on it called get markup. And our translator would call that and, and manipulate it and then emit HTML. Our, um, our abstraction also had a few other uh, methods on it, like save, so that you could save a page on the database, even though we didn't have a database, and load, so that you could load the text from a database, and so on. We didn't implement those functions. Actually, what we did is we created this derivative of Wikipage called mock Wikipage. And we used that in all of our tests. We were doing test-driven development, of course. And we did use that in all of our tests that proved that we could translate from the markup language to HTML. Three months later, we had all the translations working, but you couldn't have more than one page in the system. And the page didn't get stored anywhere. And it came time to start building the link structure between pages. We needed to write tests that showed that one page could link to another. 
and gather other pages and inherit other pages. Fitness is a kind of interesting system where you can inherit pages and from one into another. So we needed to have the database. And we said to ourselves, all right, well, let's crank up MySQL and get this going and figure out what the schema is. And somebody in the team said, we don't really have to do that yet because what we could do is implement those save and load functions in the wiki page using a hash table. And that would give us a good simulation of the behavior of a database. We thought, yeah, that's probably a good idea. And so we did that. We built a little hash table thing. We were able to store our pages in a hash table. We were able to load them from a hash table. We used that technique for about a year. Just writing all of the other behaviors of fitness. We could then get pages on the screen and link pages back and forth. We got the whole test framework working. We could run tests, couldn't save anything. We could demo it, sort of, but in order to de demo it, we actually had to go and create all the pages and then show everybody. And then, of course, if you turned the system off, they all disappeared. So that wasn't very useful for demoing purposes, but for testing purposes, it was great. And about a year after that, it finally came time to write the tests that checked the persistence mechanism. Can we bring this system up from a, from a dead state? Uh, can it load up the default pages that are supposed to be there? And in order to do that, we needed to have a database. And so we said to ourselves, well, let's, let's crank up MySQL now and figure out what the schema is and, and do that. And somebody there, it was Michael Feathers who was there. And Michael Feathers said, well, we don't have to do that yet because it would be pretty simple to take that hash table and write it out to flat files. And I thought, yeah, we could do that. It's not the end solution, but it'd be really easy and we wouldn't have to commit to the database yet. And so he worked for a day, it took him a day. And a day later he came back with this nice little derivative of wiki page called file system page. And it wrote all the hash table stuff out to flat files. And with that, we had a persistence mechanism. It was a temporary persistence mechanism, but it allowed us to continue writing our unit tests and make everything work. And now we were able to create pages and save them, and we could do real demos. You know, we could bring people in and say, look, this is how this system works. One day we'll put a database in it, but right now it's working off of flat files. How's that? Cool. And we were able to go teach classes with it. And about three or four months later, we looked at it and said, we don't need that database. This is good enough. In fact, there are advantages to it. And you can check those flat files into source code control, something we had not thought about. We can check that stuff into source code control. You can edit it with text editors. You don't need the database. And in fact, we abandoned the database project. This is an, an interesting case where a decision, a critical architectural decision, so-called, was deferred and deferred and deferred right off the end of the project. Never got made. The perfect kind of architectural decision. You never had to make it. The story would end there except for one very interesting side note. About a year after that, one of our customers came to us and said, where's that MySQL database? So what do you need that for? Well, our company has a rule. Do you have, do you have companies that have rules? Our company has a rule. All software assets have to be in the database. Who made that rule? All right, so you can't fight City Hall. We said, look, this is simple. Uh, here's the abstraction, wiki page. Look at how we did mock wiki page. Look at how we did in-memory page. Look at how we did file system page. You ought to be able to write MySQL page. We didn't do this for him. We said, you ought to be able to write MySQL page. It's an open source project. He came back a day later with the whole thing working in MySQL. It took him a day. Right? Whole thing working in MySQL, all the searches he turned into queries, everything he had done, very, very pretty. We used to ship that as a plug-in to fitness, but nobody used it, so we've dropped it. He's the only guy who ever used it. Fascinating discussion, right? This, this thing that should have been, uh, um, uh, according to most of our ways of thinking, this thing that should have been at the center of the system, the first decision made, we just pushed it off to the end.
I think you can see my screen. I've got some closure code up there at the moment. Let me bring up some other code. Actually, let me not do that. I'll do this a different way. Cross your fingers. I think you can see that on the screen. Yes, you can. Um, what I just did was to kick off the build script for fitness. Um, this is what the continuous build does. I just did it manually. It should run all of the unit tests and all of the acceptance te tests for fitness. I think it'll take about a minute and a half. That's usually how long it takes. There's 2,000 unit tests. There's about 200 and some odd acceptance tests. Test virtually every part of the system. The amount of code coverage in the unit test is on the order of 95-ish percent. Uh, the amount of code coverage on the acceptance test is much less than that because it can't get at all the exceptional conditions and stuff, around 50% maybe. But every major feature is tested at least twice through this test suite. You are also looking at the QA process. If this test passes, we ship it. There is nothing else we do, no manual tests, no other process we go through. If we get this to pass, and I'm crossing my fingers that it'll pass, then we ship it. Why is it that it runs so fast? I mean, this is a web-based system. It's got a big, thick middleware. It's got a persistence back end. There's a lot of features to it. It's a complicated system. There's around 70,000 lines of code in this system, which is, you know, not huge, but not tiny. How come I can run all those tests in what? A minute and a half, maybe? You'll see the timing at the end. How come I can run them all so fast? On my laptop. Well, first of all, I've got a very fast laptop used to take four minutes on my old laptop. Now I've got a much better laptop. My laptop is a quad core uh, with hyper threading, so it thinks it has eight cores. It really only has four, but it thinks it's got eight, and it's got uh, half a terabyte of SSD. Who's got rotating memory in their laptop? Who's got a disk in their laptop? The next laptop you have must not have a disk. Right? That's terrible. This is 2012. You cannot believe the difference it makes. Uh, what it was, a minute and 46 seconds. Why do those tests run so fast? Well, it turns out that that's an artifact of delaying all those decisions. Because what did we do initially? We had that mock wiki page. How long does that take to execute anything? Doesn't take any time at all. Right? Just all it's doing is translation. How long does it take to execute with an in-memory page that stores pages in a hash table? Nothing. There's no disk. There's no latency time. How long does it take to run the flat files? Well, they take a while. They take a while. But most of the tests here do not use the flat files. A few do. Most of them use the in-memory page or the mock page, which means that I can run my tests very, very fast. This was not the intent when we did this architectural deferment, but it was a very nice side effect. Our tests run like lightning. Let's see if I can get back to my... There, do you have that on your screen again? Good. Good architectures are not composed of tool and framework decisions, Good architectures allow you to defer tool and framework decisions like the database and the web server and the dependency injection framework. Who's got one? Now, isn't dependency injection cool? Don't you love it? Does it permeate your whole application? Do you have some monstrosity of an XML file or text file or some other file that describes all the dependency injections that go into your system? Have you lost control of this file? Anybody had to debug their system and found the bug was in that file? There's nothing wrong with dependency injection. Dependency injection is a lovely tool, but like all tools, once we first see it, we think, we should use this everywhere. No, you should not use it everywhere. The core of your application should know nothing about dependency injection. 
You can inject things around the outside. I don't have any problem with that. Usually into some partition related to Maine. And you should inject a few critical dependencies, some factories and strategies around the outside. But then after that, all other dependencies get communicated through normal means. You do not have to inject absolutely everything into every place inside the system. And in most cases, your application should not know that it is being injected. You don't want anybody putting those funny little attributes or you know, meta code in their application to support dependency injection. You don't want to do that. Right? Don't let the application know about its tools. Yes, 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 yes. I think I've made that point. Hmm. Yeah, I think I made that point too. We should not see the web-oriented models for using controllers at the top level. We should see use cases at the top level. What the hell are use cases? All right, so this guy, his name is Ivar Jakobsen. He wrote a book in 1992-ish time frame. We were eagerly awaiting this book at the time it was coming out. It was very well received. The name of the book was Object-Oriented Software Engineering, a use case driven approach. And we read the book avidly and thought, this is wonderful. He, he described this lovely architectural scheme where you put use cases front and center and everything else was around the outside. This was 1992, 20 years ago. And then we lost this. We lost it. The web came along. Anybody remember when the web came along? How it changed absolutely everything? And then 10 years later, you look around and realize it didn't change a damn thing. We're still doing software the same way we used to do. Oh, slightly different because we've got these web frameworks, but it's still software. Still writing his statements and while loops and assignment statements. Didn't actually change everything. Oh, it changed the world, certainly. But it did not change software nearly as much as we thought, except it did drive this thought out of our head. There came a moment in 1999 when companies were so incredibly hungry for programmers that they would hire people off the street if they had a J in their name. If you had a J in your name, you must know Java. Come, come, work for us. We'll pay you thousands and thousands of dollars every month so that you cannot write code, because obviously you're not really a programmer. That's actually sounding a little familiar to today in certain areas, isn't it? Social networking areas are avidly trying to gather as many Ruby programmers and, and all these hotshot other programmers out there. And I wonder if we're not looking at another one of those interesting bubbles. But never mind that. From about 1999 on, we lost this. The whole notion of software architecture was driven out of our minds because we were in a mad race to get stuff working on the web. And that just took over everything. And frameworks started appearing. Yeah, Sun made their first J2EE, and Microsoft came along pretty quickly thereafter and had their framework, and all these people had their frameworks. And we all looked at those frameworks and said, oh, thank you for the frameworks. And we enslaved ourselves to them and lost the notion that the architecture should be about use cases. And then, of course, the bubble popped. And we all found ourselves wondering if we would have a job. I don't know how it affected you guys here in Norway. In the US, it was fairly traumatic. You know, we're all looking around going, Jesus, we're going to have a job? How are we going to work over the next few years? And it was a very tough time. And during that time, we were all scrambling like crazy. And anybody who came out with another framework was, was blessed and said, oh, thank you for that framework because it makes us go faster. Again, perpetuating the notion that we had enslaved ourselves to frameworks and not really kept the architecture. Well done. A use case looks like this. This is the create order use case. Very simple idea. Some of you may remember use cases from the 90s. And the idea is e easy enough. You write down what the inputs to the system are, what outputs the system should generate, the processing that's in the middle, and you don't mention the delivery mechanism at all. This uh, tells us that we're going to create an order. The incoming data is the customer ID, the shipment destination, the payment information, blah, blah, blah. None of that says anything about a web. That information may come in on a web form, 
It might come in through the console. It might come in through a sick client. It might come in over a soap call. God help you. (laughs) But we don't care. The use case is agnostic. It does not care how the information gets there, and it does not care where the information goes. The use case is about how the system behaves with its business rules. Use cases are not controllers in model view controller. Controllers in model view controller are bound to the web. They're all about URLs and paths. They're all about what view gets executed. They are not the use cases, at least not the way we write them. They are not the use cases of our system. They are the interactions of our system. I like to take Jakobsen's model, Ivar Jakobsen's model, and describe it this way. He had three primary kinds of objects. Entity objects, which are business rules. Boundary objects, which we'll talk about. They're essentially interfaces. And interactor objects. He actually called these controllers, which is confusing because that sounds like model view controllers. So we will call them interactors. Entities contain application-independent business rules. What does it mean to be application-independent? We have an enterprise. Our enterprise has lots of business objects in it. The methods in those business objects do not depend on what application is running. They are methods that support all applications. The interactors, on the other hand, have application-specific business rules in them, The interactor knows what kind of application this is. And the business rules inside that interactor are particular to this this application. It will control the business objects in a particular way to achieve the goals of the application. Notice that nowhere in there did I mention the web. Nowhere in there did I mention the database. All I mentioned were the interactors and the entities and these boundary things. A good architecture hangs the UI off to the side like an appendix. Why? Because UIs get inflamed and you have to remove them. Anybody remember when we removed the last user interface? When the web came along and all of our old user interfaces disappeared, they got inflamed, we had to go cut them out and put a new user interface in? That happens to us every once in a while. We would like our applications to be able to survive that operation. So we construct them this way. What you see here is an interactor in the middle in bright red. There are these two blue things off to the side, the request model and the response model. These are data structures, raw data structures, which is why I drew them as ovals. The squares here are classes. The ovals are data structures. The request model is a pure data structure. It has no trappings of the web in it, whatever. It's just a bunch of variables in whatever form you'd like to carry them. They somehow come through the boundary, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and they get to an interactor. There will be one interactor per use case. The name of that class should not be interactor. It should be add customer, or create order, or delete employee, something like that. Fire employee, that's a good one. Huh? Can't do that here in Norway easily, can you? So maybe you don't need that one here. The interactor will receive the request model. What's in that request model? All the data specified by the use case. Then the interactor goes and finds the entities somewhere. We'll talk about how it finds them later, but it goes and gets the entities, and it calls the appropriate methods on the entities, and then it gathers the data from the entities that it might need, and it creates the response model. The response model is just another data structure. This may sound similar to you. It sounds like HTTP request and HTTP response, except it doesn't have the HTTP in front of it, which is the point. If it's got HTTP in front of it, it's all about the web. I want to divorce the web here. The web is gone. Given that structure, could you test that interactor? 
Well, yeah. You create the data structure, hand it to the interactor, get the response back from the interactor, and inspect it. It's easy. You can test that interactor. You can test all the interactors. And better yet, you don't need the web server running to do it. Any of you have that problem where you want to test something inside your system, but it has to run inside the web server, and, and you don't know how the heck to run a test while the web server is running? Well, the answer to that is don't run the damn web server. Don't bind your application to the web server. Make sure that you can run your entire set of use cases without the web server around, with no, no dependencies pointing at the web server, no dependencies pointing at any of those horrible frameworks that give you the web server. Run your objects, run your business rules as plain old objects without hanging dependencies off them. Here's how this works. Some user talks to the delivery mechanism. I don't care what that delivery mechanism is. It might be the web, it might be a console, it might be web services, SOAP. The user does something to the delivery mechanism. I don't care what. Let's say it's the web. Eventually a controller gets invoked, model view controller, still working here, still, still in here. A controller gets invoked. The job of the controller is to unpack the web request and create the request model data structure. Then it passes that request model through an interface, through that boundary interface into the interactor. Notice how the interactor derives from one of the boundaries. The controller will use that interface to send the request model into the interactor. The interactor then sends data to the entities. It controls the dance of the entities. It invokes their, business, their, their application independent business rules. It invokes its own application dependent business rules. Then it gathers up the data from the entities to create the response model which it then passes back through a boundary. Notice the opposite inheritance relationship here. The controller, or maybe something else, something else in the delivery mechanism derives from this boundary and passes that result model back into the delivery mechanism so that it can be deployed and displayed. And this is not rocket science, it's fairly simple. What's very interesting about it is look at the direction of the dependencies coming out of the delivery. The delivery depends on the application. The application does not depend on the delivery. The application's got no idea what that delivery stuff is. Doesn't care. In fact, the delivery, the web, is a plugin to the application. Everybody knows how to make a plugin. We like making plugins. Plugins are cool. Okay, so make the delivery mechanism, the web, a plugin to your application. That thing that contains the web server, plug it into the application. Don't build it into the application. Plug it in. Make a plugin. All these architectural decisions that we want to defer, how do we defer them? We turn them into plugins. How do we get the data out on the screen? Well, that boundary, that boundary uh, interface is implemented by a presenter. That response model gets passed by the interactor through the boundary interface to a presenter. That presenter then takes this raw response data and formats it appropriately turns it all into strings, adds all the currency notation, makes sure that all the slashes are in the right place for dates, uh, makes sure that all the booleans are properly set up for, for menu items and so on. Everything that needs to be done in order to present the data on the web, if the web is your intended de destination, is done by this presenter. The presenter then creates the view model. You guys in .NET know what a view model is. All right, we're going to create that view model, and we're going to hand that view model to the view. And notice how I've put the view here in uh, faded colors, because the view has no intelligence at all. The, views, the view does this. Oh, I got a view model. Get this, put it there. Get this, put it there. Get this, put it there. That's it. 
No decisions. Maybe you've got a loop in there because you've got to fill up a grid or something. But there's hardly any interesting decisions being made by the view model. By the view, it's all just stupid plumbing. Can you test that presenter? Yeah, you hand it a response model. You cook up a response model. You hand it to it. Make sure you get the right, right view model out. Can you test the view? Sure. You cook, cook up a view model and hand it to the view and make sure you get the right HTML out. You can test everything here. Okay. And then it's all very easy to test. You don't need all that fancy framework stuff running. Everything is easy to test. We wind up with a system where the delivery mechanism can be replicated. We could have a web delivery and a console delivery for the same app. Oh, and maybe a SOAP delivery. Maybe we'd have a thick client delivery mechanism too without changing the app, without the app even knowing that there's a difference because all these delivery mechanisms are plugins, appendixes, hanging off the side. Does that look familiar? Anybody architected their system this way? Even if you didn't draw the diagram, it's how you thought about it. The database is the god of the system. Everything else is around the outside, little details. If there's some function we don't know where to put, we'll put it in the database. The database will handle it because the database is almighty. The database is powerful. Who likes that model? Database vendors. Database vendors think that's great. And they agree with you. Yes, the database is God. Protect your data. In fact, the database vendors are so invested in this model that they created an entire job function to manage the database. Oh, yeah, we need special people to manage the database, not normal programmers. Normal programmers aren't capable of this. No, we, need, we need specially trained, highly expert people to manage the data. What a load of crap. Not that you don't need people who understand the tool, but the database is not the center of your system. Oh, yes, the data is in off in many cases. The data is critical. The database, that's a tool. That's a detail. Get that off the screen. Get it off to the side. It's not important. You do need the data, and you need, need, need to manage the data nicely. But the mechanism by which it's managed is a detail. And the, D, the DBAs can be over there on the side. That's fine. They can manage the detail over there. OK, fine, fine. They're not part of the programmer's world. So the programmers want to take the database and just completely shrink it down to nothing, turn it into a detail off to the side, another plug-in. Doesn't mean you don't have a database. It just means it's not the first thing you think of. And you certainly don't relegate functionality to it. Anybody got business rules and stored procedures? What kind of nonsense is that? Stored procedures are meant for Fast queries, data integrity, they're database like things. Why would you put business rules inside the database tool? That's the ultimate enslavement of business rules, to actually move them into the tool. Now, the business rules are in the tool. God help you, because the database vendor won't. How do you isolate the database? Well, it's just the same way as anything else. It's a plugin. We're going to turn the database into a plugin. Our interactors will use some interface, which we call an entity gateway. The entity gateway has a set of methods in it that represent all of the queries and all of the updates you want to do. There is no SQL above the line. There is no hibernate above the line. If you're using nHibernate, it goes below the line. The application does not know that you are using that framework. It goes below the line. And Hibernate's a lovely tool. It's very good for gathering data out of a database and turning it into data structures. Very nice. But you don't want your application to know that you're using it. You put all that stuff below the line. You get this entity gateway implementation. That's not the name of the class, obviously. You'd have a bunch of these classes but some kind of repository structure so that you've got interfaces that the interactors can use to get the data through an unknown means, and then you have an implementation below the line that gets it out of your database or stores it back into your database. Just a plug-in, real simple. 
This puts the database where it belongs. It's a detail off to the side. It allows you to test the system without the database there. I can now write tests against all my use cases and replace the database with flat files if I want to, hash tables if I want to, just plain old stubs if I want to. I can test all those use cases without the database. Anybody got tests that are running, it takes them two hours to run because they're running in the database? <laughs> you can run them in 15 seconds if you get the database out of the picture, which of course you'd like to do. These machines are fast, right? This machine's a quad core, uh, two and a half gigahertz, which means it can execute 10 billion instructions per second. Does your application have 10 billion instructions in it? Probably not, which means you ought to be able to test your application in less than a second. All the decisions it makes, all the if statements, all the while loops, everything it does, you ought to be able to test in less than 10 billion instructions, which this machine could do in less than a second. So if it's taking hours, either you're spending most of that time waiting for some piece of metal to spin, or you are replicating instructions over and over and over and over again. Anybody have tests that have to log in first? And then you do that over and over again. Now I need to test this way we're going to buy that thing. Log in, navigate, buy it. Okay, now I want to test another way to buy it. Log in, navigate, test it. How many times are you going to execute that log in, navigate crap? Your test should avoid all that stuff. Just go right to the thing and test it. You're programmers, you know how to do that. Oh yes, well I was going to spend a lot of time talking about test-driven development, but I may do that another time. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, we're just about done here, there's three minutes. I'm not going to ask you for any questions live, but if you want to talk to me afterwards, feel free. And remember to grab green pieces of paper and put them in the bucket. Thank you.